There are a lot of different homeschooling methods out there, but when you're homeschooling a large family, a lot of those don't seem to fit. However, I would encourage you to find a way to adjust some of your favorite homeschooling methods to make them work for you and your large family. And today I'm going to tell you how. Hello friends, welcome to the Raising Arrows podcast. I'm Amy Roberts from RaisingArrows.net and this is episode number 154, how to adjust a homeschool method for a large family. Now, before we go any further, I want to share with you that I have written an e-booklet called How to Make Any Curriculum Work for Your Family. And while this is more going to be about methods and tweaking those methods, it might be a good idea to pick up that e-booklet to help you adjust even further with your various curricula in order to make them more large family friendly or just to work for your family in general. That link will be in the description so that you can check out that e-booklet, How to Make Any Curriculum Work for Your Family. I hope that book will be a blessing to you because it's very important to be economical with our finances, our curriculum, the things that we do for our homeschool so that we maximize our effort, we maximize our dollars, and we come up with a way to homeschool that really works for us and our budget. But like I said, this is going to be more about homeschooling methods. Today, I'm going to talk about five different homeschooling methods and how you can tweak those and adjust those for your large family. There are many others out there, but I hope this will get the ball rolling for you on some ideas for what you can do to take some of your favorite parts of different homeschooling methods and make them work for your large family. You don't have to just abandon certain homeschool methods that you think really sound like a great idea just because you have a larger than average family. The first method I'm going to address is classical homeschooling. Classical homeschooling at its essence is a liberal arts education based on the Greek method of education, which involves teaching your child at the cognitive level they are at and really maximizing on that, typically in a four-year history-based, chronological history-based cycle. So you have grammar, upper grammar, dialectic, and rhetoric. Dialectic would be around junior high, and then you have rhetoric would be more your high school level courses. And it is supposed to be going along with your child's development and working with that and then teaching them a lot of the traditional educational methods and ideas like logic and fine arts and literature. And so it is a very robust education and it can be very overwhelming if it's not done in a group setting or done in a classical school. If you are trying to implement it by yourself at home, the classical method can seem a little daunting and like too much for a large family. In fact, even in a setting where you're using an umbrella school or you're doing a hybrid kind of school, it can still feel a little overwhelming for the parent to do a classical education because of how much is involved in it. I have always been fascinated by classical education and that was because back in the day, many, many years ago, I became enthralled with Tapestry of Grace, which uses a classical method of education. The author had a large family as well and so I felt like perhaps I could make this work. I loved how robust her educational methods were. I loved how she had all these living books and all this information, this smorgasbord, as she calls it, of things to choose from, from from projects to literature to fine arts to all kinds of things. I was just fascinated by the the curriculum overall. So I really, really wanted to implement that kind of education into my homeschool. It really spoke to my soul, maybe because I have a degree in English. And so that was a lot of what I was living as a college student, because you got to remember, I wasn't that far out of college when I started homeschooling. And so I think that is why it really was interesting to me and I wanted to implement that in our homeschool. However, the classical method is a lot. And with a large family, I did end up abandoning Tapestry of Grace at one point because I just didn't feel like I could handle it. 
if I had done what I'm going to tell you to do now, I think I could totally have made it work. And later on down the road, I did make it work with a large family. But initially, I could not figure out, could not wrap my brain around how to make this classical education work for us. So when it comes to adjusting a classical education for a large family, absolutely, you can go to some sort of co-op or group that kind of helps you and walks alongside you with the classical method, or you can tweak things at home yourself. And one of the ways that you can tweak those is to simply follow the four-year chronological cycle and not worry about anything else. There are lots of extras that you can add into programs that are classically based. Those programs will help you teach alongside your child and not have to do all the things. Because this is something that our family does, I'm gonna share with you how that looks in our family. So we do use Tapestry of Grace. We use it as our historical spine. We use it during morning time. And what I do is I assign literature from that particular time period in history from their book list. We talk through the different historical things that are going on. I read from the books that they suggest. And then I also supplement with music and fine arts from places like Music in Our Homeschool. She is also a Tapestry of Grace classical mom. So she has really tailor-made her classes to fit with Tapestry of Grace or other classical methods. And so I use that as my fine arts and my music, and I don't have to figure that out. It's already done for me. And we put that into our morning time. We do it all together. Yes, even my little kids. They may not be retaining very much of it, but basically what I do is I teach to the middle and I assign to the edges. So what that means is I'm kind of teaching toward the upper grammar dialectic age. That's what I'm doing during morning time. I'm using those books and those concepts and those questions. And then I'm using projects and literature that goes to the edges. So my little kids are getting books that are more on their level. My big kids are getting more of the high school books. The projects that go to the high school kids are more robust and a bigger deal than the little fun projects that we're doing with the little kids. So as you can see, I'm teaching to the middle, assigning to the edges, and that's how you can make classical education work for a large family without knocking yourself out trying to do all the different levels for all your kids. So try bringing them all together for morning time, teaching to the middle, and then sending them off with literature and project assignments that actually speak to their specific ages. The next homeschooling method I'd like to touch on is another one near and dear to my heart, and that is Charlotte Mason. Charlotte Mason and classical education can go hand in hand very nicely. There are differing parts of each, but I have found that Charlotte Mason method is just as overwhelming to the large family as the classical education method is. So I have really had to tweak the Charlotte Mason method to work for me as well. There is a book that I highly recommend if you are just kind of getting started in the Charlotte Mason homeschooling and you kind of need a step-by-step -step guide that will just add on things a little bit at a time for you to be able to tell what you can handle and what you can't handle. And that is called Charlotte Mason Homeschooling in 18 Easy Step-by-Step -step Lessons. I believe is what it's called. It's by Cindy West from Our Journey Westward. And I really, really think that book is incredibly useful, especially to the large family mom who is wanting to implement Charlotte Mason methods, but is thinking, I don't know if I can do this and I don't really know what I'm doing anyway. And then it also helps you to refine whether or not these things that go along with the Charlotte Mason education are actually something you can implement in your homeschool. They may not be. And because it's broken down for you, you can pick and choose, cherry pick out of there what actually works and what doesn't work. So that's a really great way to test the waters of a Charlotte Mason education as a large family mom. For us, the way that we have implemented a Charlotte Mason education kind of doesn't look very Charlotte Mason y, I'll be truthful about that. We don't do narration. We don't do dictation and copy work. Um, we do a lot of nature walks. And we also really like the fine arts and the living books. So that's probably more where the Charlotte Mason comes from for me. I like my kids to be out in nature and I like the living books. And as far as narration goes, 
we have conversations, lots of conversations. So for me, that's more what the narration and dictation is, where I'm actually just having conversations with my kids instead of doing more of a full blown, write it down, copy work, all of that kind of stuff. We do a traditional handwriting program. We don't do copy work. And so um, that's how much of the Charlotte Mason is actually infiltrating into our homeschool. There's not a lot, but I loved the idea of the method. I read a lot from Karen Andriola. I would highly recommend her books just as an inspiration and a great read for mom. But I couldn't do a lot of what the Charlotte Mason method suggested. However, I do have a blog post about notebooking with a large family. And I do think that might be a big help to you to see how you can tweak notebooking. We don't always do notebooking. In fact, we rarely do notebooking. But the method that I use is very doable for a large family. If you are interested in adding that in as a Charlotte Mason piece, but you can't quite figure out what that looks like for a large family. I'll have that linked in the description for you so that you can check that out. Oh, also we really like composer and hymn studies. And guess what? Music in our homeschool has those. So we've just implemented those into our everyday morning time. And it's worked really well for us to kind of have that mishmash of classical and Charlotte Mason. Number three, I'm going to kind of mix a bunch together and just call it nature-based education. This could be Waldorf and Montessori and just what people call nature-based education. There's also Charlotte Mason mixed into that, which is why I wanted to bring this in now. Basically, it wants kids to be outside in the natural world, involving themselves in God's green earth as much as possible, even to the point where you're using sticks and rocks for math and you're doing most of your lessons outside. It does have a little bit of an unschooling component, which we will talk about that in a minute, but it's, it's very much nature-based. Now this can get a little weird, a little new agey, and obviously I don't want any of that, but God created this world. And so I feel like as a homeschooling mom who has a large family, it is a really good idea for us to get outside and run off some of that energy and be a part of God's green earth and learn as much as we can about it. So I recommend kind of mishmashing the Charlotte Mason and the nature base together, making sure that you are letting the kids be hands-on with nature, but then also giving them the information that they need. There are lots of great handbooks. Um, the anatomy books from Julia Rotham, the farm anatomy, nature anatomy, all of those, those are so, so good. Any curriculum that has this nature component to it is really, really good, especially for young kids because it gets them outside and doing something different. It's really hard for little kids to sit at a table. And so as a large family mom, if you can get them outside doing things in nature, that is a really great way to burn off some of those wiggles and help your kids also be in touch with the things that God has created. Now, the trouble that comes with this is if you don't have room to run, and you don't have a fenced in yard, and you don't have a place you can go easily to let them be out in nature, then it kind of tends to be a little burdensome for the large family mom because you're going out in nature and all you're doing is counting heads and keeping track of people and that's not the easiest thing in the world to do. So I understand that. And what I would suggest would be something along the lines of maybe a family zoo membership a membership to an observatory, something that gets them out in nature that you can buy one membership to, and it gives you and your kids an opportunity to be around nature, do some of these nature-based projects, but you don't have to pay a big fee and you don't have to try to count heads all the time. And you can go into this more enclosed area and enjoy that time together. We have had many zoo memberships over the years. And a lot of times what we would do is just go to a certain area of the zoo, not try to hit it all, but to focus on a certain area, do some unit studies that have to do with that animal that you're going to be seeing. Um, let them have opportunity to look at the foliage and the things that are on the ground at the zoo. Obviously not like the 
melted popsicles and that kind of stuff. But you know, like the bugs and the plants and the foliage and the trees and all the things that are around in the area along with the animals. And it gives them a chance to be out in nature in a little more of a confined space for you as a mom. And the really great thing about these memberships is that you can go during school hours when it's less likely that there's gonna be a lot of people there. You also might check and see if there's anyone that you know or a neighbor nearby who has a fenced in yard that you would be allowed to use for some of these nature based studies where you could let the kids run, you could relax and you could let them do some of these nature based studies in somebody else's yard as long as you promise to clean up or do something for them, bring them baked goods, something like that. It's just maybe a trade off would be a good idea. I also know there were times when a lot of the nature-based stuff we did was because we went over and saw the grandparents and we were able to go there and just kind of run and not feel like I was needing to focus so much. That was especially when we didn't have like a fenced in yard or a place for the kids to go. That said, nature-based activities can mesh pretty much with any curriculum. And so I would highly encourage you to get your kids outside periodically, take them on nature walks, do a nature scavenger hunt. There's lots and lots of free activities as well online that will encourage you to get your kids out there and doing things outside. But it definitely is important, especially for a large family mom and her kids to be outside to get some sun on your head, as I always tell my kids, and to run around and enjoy God's green earth. The next method I want to talk about is unschooling. Now, there are a lot of misconceptions about unschooling. Obviously, there are extremes. There is radical unschooling where you do absolutely nothing. And sometimes that is important, especially if you are de-schooling, where you are bringing a child out of the public school system and they need a hot minute to just chill and not be doing anything that even smacks of education just to kind of reset. But most unschooling does have an educational component to it. And so be aware when you hear that word that that doesn't mean we don't do anything. As far as unschooling goes, I wouldn't consider myself an unschooler, but we do only school four days a week. And I do what's called strewing where I leave things laying around, but I would not consider myself a an unschooler. As far as the strewing goes, this is an important component. You want to leave materials laying around for your kids to interact with, and then you want to follow up with the interests that they have from the materials that you've left lying around. The way to work this with a large family is try to guide everybody to the same topic and then do unit studies based on those topics take them to the library, get them books that have to do with individual interests. But when it comes to doing something as a family, try to keep them all on the same track. And unit studies are a fantastic way to do that. Again, when you're doing unit studies though, because that's also a homeschooling method, pick out of it the things that don't necessarily speak to your heart as a homeschooling mother or seem like too much busy work or things that you just don't wanna involve yourself in. And again, just like the classical education method, teach to the middle, assign to the edges. So with unit studies, teach to the middle of what your kids can handle and then give the coloring pages to the little kids and the word finds and crossword puzzles to the older kids and assign some books that help with that. Unschooling and unit studies are really a great way to cover a lot of different topics and to not make it feel too much like education, sitting in a desk all day long kind of stuff. This is a really good method too for transitioning out of the public school system and giving everybody a breather or what we like to call a Jubilee year. I do have a podcast on having a Jubilee year that is definitely worth listening to, especially if you're feeling burned out and you need a little bit of a break as a homeschooling mom. Okay, the final method that I wanna talk about is just workbooks and online learning, computer-based schooling. Maybe you're doing some sort of K-12 program online through your public school, or maybe you are just feeling like all you can handle are workbooks. You really need to outsource everything. I am not here to judge. In fact, I have a podcast about using workbooks to homeschool. I'd encourage you to listen to that one. And basically, I'm gonna give some of the same advice. 
It is fine to be doing the bulk majority of your homeschooling with workbooks and online resources. However, remember that you are a family. You are a mother and you are not just a facilitator or a teacher. In fact, you're more a mother than you are those things. And so don't forget to mother your children. And what does that look like? Think about the things that interest you the things that you enjoy doing, and then try to pass those on to your kids as extracurriculars or as extra projects or things that you can do together as a family. Don't just send them off to homeschool and then not do anything else with them. Homeschooling all by themselves, isolated somewhere day in and day out is not homeschooling. It is just schooling at home and it's an unfortunate way to do things because it does not build the family. And you really want to build those relationships with your kids. When we bring our kids home from a traditional public school setting, we want to build those relationships. And it takes time. It takes energy. It takes projects and memories and things that you do together. And so if you're outsourcing to workbooks and online um, resources and things like that, that's fine. However, you need to have some things that you're doing together as a family. And so if you can think about the things that are interesting to you, the topics, the subjects, the things you really enjoyed in school, and try to do some of those things with your kids, that works very well, even in a large family setting. And I know as a large family, sometimes the workbooks and the online stuff is what you need because you feel stretched thin. But if you can find a way to bring them all back together, to do stuff together, that is a fantastic way to build your homeschooling environment and your homeschooling family. Okay, friends, remember to pick up that e-booklet, How to Make Any Curriculum Work for Your Family. I know that it will really, really help you when it comes to individual curriculum and, and not wasting money because perhaps you're at the point now where you bought something this summer and you're wondering why you bought it. And that e-booklet will kind of help you figure out how to tweak it to actually make it work and make your dollar stretch and not feel like you wasted a whole bunch of time and money. Thank you so much for joining me here at Raising Arrows. We will see you next time.